There he is. There we go. Hey, how you doing? What's going on, Paige? Not much. <clears throat> Welcome. Welcome to I Ask No One. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thanks. This, this thing's a little low. I have it set for my fretboard height. For ah, so people can see my fretboard. How's that? Pretty good. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Awesome backdrop you got there. Oh, it's my workroom. Yeah, I'm um, just horsing around. Kind of, I've got a couple things to do today, so I have some three lessons, I think, or three or four lessons later. So, just doing some, and then I'm finishing a mix for this French band um, on this uh, a track that I produced for them. And um, yeah, I got and I got to start this Chicago band. So, just a bunch of little shit before the weekend. <laughs> fun, fun. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to to spend with me here in buffalo yeah, new york no problem, no problem, man. of course yeah where, where are you buffalo new york actually right of course that makes sense that's why you asked me about buffalo yeah <laughs> cool yeah you ever been oh. any memories of buffalo new york i have memories uh i have a couple memories you know when i was in band of susans in 1988 that's where they originated so um robert and ron and susan i believe were all three from buffalo did um, not know that wow yeah yeah so we um so we had family kind of times there 1980 way back in 1988 um and the other memory i have is opening i believe for faith no more at a an awful sounding venue that was it was a really cool venue vi uh, visually but it was this um I, I, it was some kind of public space. I don't know if it was a library or a train station or um, something that was not meant for 118 decibel rock music because it was just this like, ah, right. I remember that gig very, very well. Like certain things stand out, you know, and those are kind of, that's what I, don't, what I meant, remember. I also found a guitar there, uh, which I believe is that can you see the black one on the wall back there? Yeah, no kidding. Wow. Yeah, it's an it's an early um, uh, GNL. You know, George and Leo when they left, when they sold Fender to uh, uh, CBS, they started this amazing guitar company. And Robert Poss from Band of Susans is an uh, is a GNL aficionado. So I have, I just have three left. The ones that are on the wall, the red, the white, black, and can you see the cream colored one sort of over there. Beautiful. Um, yeah, they're amazing guitars. They're really, really phenomenal. And um, I actually used the red one in the Biscuits for Smut video. Huh. Uh, stupidly, because we were out in the rain in Red Hook, Brooklyn, and uh, it got wet, but uh, it's fine. It's amazing. It sounds amazing. It, it dried out. There's a little bit of cracking around the frets, but um, yeah, they're really cool. Really, I was actually think considering uh, sanding the neck down on that one just because I have three of them try but i but the guy talked me out of it at my this guy in um, uh, my guitar shop here on hoover street ruben he's like you could you could not do it and i'm like i'm just thinking i mean i have three of them I'm maybe just one different he's like yeah it's a pretty cool guitar and i'm like i know i know and he's one of those guitar collector geeks that's like keep it original keep it you know so so i kept it original but um yeah that that black one I was trying to remember where was we Angel were. Dust tour was it? Uh, uh, it was that was the tour with Faith No More. Yeah, I bought that black GNL on the uh, Band of Susans tour um, when we played with Steve Albini's band Rape Man, um, uh, his band right after Big Black, um, and uh, we played with Wire that year. Um, I can't, the band of Susan's, the, uh, yeah, that guitar is, there's still dried blood on it. Cause you know, early on when I, you know, I hadn't played rock music for really since uh, college cause I was a jazz studying jazz and classical guitar. And so, um, my fingers weren't used to the thrashing this, you know, the shit out of the guitar and they get, my fingers would just get bloody on the, my right hand, bad technique, I'm sure. Um, and so there's this dried kind of blood on the top of that black guitar. You can't see it because it's black, but um, I just left it. I never cleaned it. <laughs> cleaned it off. It's gross. That's so but... badass. I, I have to just say Gary Holt of Exodus and Slayer, one of the coolest guitarists I've ever seen live. He actually, uh, he had someone take his blood 
and use it as paints on the actual guitar. And he made like this, uh, like this satanic goat kind of thing out of the blood. I mean, that was oh, just- funny. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. He's um, my guitar guy that designed my, um, my distortion, my uh, Paige Hamilton distortion pedal. He, um, he did a pedal for Gary um, and speaks very highly of him. Said he's a really, really great guy. I met him once and he was really nice, but it's, it's, it's that one right there is mine. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, I met him, I can't remember. I think it was, I, I want to say it was with, did he play with Testament? Did he? Or, maybe he filled in no, for a few well, maybe, shows. I, I think it was Exodus maybe playing with Testament. Uh, because he was it was it was before he uh joined uh Slayer, it was before um uh Jeff Hanneman, Jeff passed, yeah. Uh, and that's the last time I saw Slayer it was the the four guys, you know, it was Jeff and Carrie, and um, because we were in Germany and we went up on the Hitler where Hitler gave that speech, um, at, at the stadium in Nuremberg. The, the triumph of the will that movie that was made that a Nazi propaganda movie. And I happened to go up there at the same time as the Slayer guys. And um, they were up there, Tom and Carrie and Jeff were up all up there. Uh, uh, Lombardo wasn't up there, but um, yeah, I went, you know, was able to go spit on the door that Hitler walked through and spit on the spot that he's st- it's just stupid, but whatever. It's like, fuck, fuck that, you know? Right. Just, a little but it's kind of cool to be up there with the slayer guys you know who wrote angel of death yeah you know it and what what were their responses like what kind of conversations did you have with slayer were they just like wow we love you or nothing no no No. they have no interest um either they didn't know who i was or or no interest in me they were john tempesta uh, was in my band at the time um and he played with uh, testament and exodus and zombie and he's in the cult now and he and Carrie got really drunk on Jägermeister and put a, put a hole in one of the cubicle walls in our um, dressing room. But uh, fortunately, um, they, they let us off the hook because Marilyn Manson had trashed his entire um, <laughs> day dressing room and cost thousands of dollars worth of damage. So they were like, don't worry about it. You guys, you guys are cool. But um, yeah, I, I didn't... I watched Slayer. It was cool. Um, I like their music. Um, they didn't maybe, I don't know if they knew helmet or maybe that, you know what, I have no idea. Um, I just sort of keep to myself anyway, on the road. If someone, um, um, says hi, then I'll say hi, you know, say hi. I, I mean, I saw Chris Cor- Cornell at NRG and he didn't say anything to me. So I, I saw him standing side of stage uh, while we were playing once in Seattle, um, with Eddie Vedder, but I, they didn't say anything to me. So, I, you know, I was on stage, obviously. Um, yeah, if somebody wants to talk to me, I'll, I'll talk, but I'm not going to, you know, go, go bother people, whatever. It's like, I, you know. When was that with Cornell? Was that 90s or? When I saw, I saw him at the studio? Yeah, when you guys were passing by with Vetter, you were. Uh, well, that was, the, 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 Vetter and Cornell were uh, in Seattle when we were opening for Nirvana in 90. That was 92. 92, maybe something like that. So I think so that sounds about right. Cause we yeah. played with Nirvana. We played with Nirvana in 91 in New York when they, the day that kind of the day after, I think they became a three piece Like Jason, I think they had just kicked Jason out or he'd left or whatever. And uh, Chad was drumming for them. Um, and uh, we played with them and then God, I mean, I just swear it was a year later. They were on, they were huge. They'd sold like 10 million records or whatever. And we were, playing with them it was fun it was really fun yeah um, i definitely want to uh get into nirvana and a few more questions and it's just you just brought up so many things i, I want to talk about but at the top of every episode i like to cheers and i just want to say thank you again and cheers uh believe oh, it, yeah. we're gonna go back to kerry king here because oh hilarious this is my <laughs> juice at the top of every episode page oh cool i got budweiser at home so all right cheers man my that's my noon my noon beverage after coffee I love it. But I also want to dedicate this episode to my late great friend, Michael J. Holden. Uh, Michael uh, lost his battle with depression in 2018 in uh, October, and he lived 30 beautiful years. And when I hear your voice on records, on any of your records, uh, you're the top two or three voices that remind me of Michael. And he was a very, very big fan of yours. Oh, cool. 
he's right here right now and God, i'm so um, sorry that's 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 rough man. thank that's... you yeah, his parents are going to watch this uh with a lot of pride so awesome stuff man r.i.p mike holden i have uh, a few few stories people i have a bandana that that i busted out during the um pandemic that was given to me from a um you know a fan whose buddy um uh, uh, took his took his own life was a huge Allen fan so I wear it I, I you know I wear that like as in you know to honor him um and uh I I lost my cousin that way uh, a, a little over a year ago um it was pretty it's pretty it's um yeah it's hard it's hard to ever come to terms with it from our perspective you know um and uh it's it's you know, you hope they're in a better place and that they made the right, you know, choice for them. It's just sad. My cousin, and I, it was a very violent and I just, I feel so, you know, I, I, you don't know, you know, cause there's nothing, you, I, I had guilt, you know, I know her knew her since she was this big, you know, cute little thing with smelly feet. This, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm so, so sorry. Yeah. It's a, it's a terrible thing to, God bless your cousin and, and Michael Holden as well. I'm going to include a link below to uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And uh, anyone who's watching could donate right there at that link, uh, myself included. So yeah. I also like to uh, start every episode with a little fact of the day. So today is February the 12th, going to go live on this episode tomorrow. And today in music, Pink Floyd released their 10th studio record, Animals, 1977. I know how much of a fan of uh, compositions you are, you know, start to finish full records, musical scores and so on. Were you a fan of that stuff back then when it was coming out, Pink Floyd and those amazing records? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was, it, was it, it kind of, Pink Floyd feels like freshman, sophomore, college years because um, The Wall came out, let's see. I graduated high school in 78. So I was started college in 1978. Yeah. You know, in the fall and, uh, the, the albums that were on re regular rotate, I mean, the wall was, it was everywhere, like everywhere, every dorm, every house. I moved into a house with a bunch of deadheads. Um, and even though they were deadheads, they, they all loved Floyd. Um, but they listened to a lot of grateful dead bootleg cassette tapes that they passed around. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so Floyd, I remember a cop coming to we, uh, one house we lived in, a cop came to the door and uh, I was always nervous when cops came to the door because we had, you know, we had drugs, we had, we had hash, we, we, we took, I took out an emergency student loan and bought pot um, and, you know, we were going to make money on it and, and, you know, of course we didn't because we smoked it, but uh, we were listening to Dark Side of the Moon, uh, apparently really loud. And the cops came to the door and I thought, oh my God, I hope they don't, you know, hope we don't get busted. They just told us to turn the music down. They didn't say anything about, you know, we had a bomb, one of those dragon bongs that's like, you know, waist high sitting in the corner. And like there were sheets of blotter acid on top of the TV set. Um, and we had stolen the, the plastic cow from the dairy mart um, and had a, a punch bowl, put a punch bowl in the plastic cows. That, that was in the kitchen. So, we could have gotten in a lot of trouble, um, but yeah, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> that was in Oregon or Oregon? That was in Oregon, yeah. Okay. In, in Eugene, yeah. Eugene. Eugene, where I was in college. So yeah, I think Floyd was a huge part of uh, huge part of that that era in my life. Um, and I got I got into him later. I find a lot of stuff that I liked when I was younger. I'll di I'll rediscover it and um, and kind of fi find what's great about it. It was really funny because Stanier, uh, John Stanier, who was the the first drummer in Helmet, it's a phenomenal talent and, and had some, you know, interesting listening tastes. He was kind of listening to whatever was cutting edge hip hop or drum and bass or whatever. And he turned me on to a lot of great music, but he also had some crazy ideas about like he thought Pink Floyd, uh, he thought Nicky Mason was terrible and the Pink Floyd sucked. He thought that Jimi Hendrix sucked. He thought that T-Rex sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Because those drummers aren't flashy, but I just, man, I, I, I defy anyone to try to play a groove like Nick Mason, you know, like that. It's, it's, yeah, it's other, uh, it's otherworldly to me. I love, love their songs, obviously, and the music is, and everybody in the band, you know, Gilmore's solo. I read uh, solos. I read a 
article about him trying to play fast, trying to, it's like, I tried to increase my speed. I just can't, I couldn't, you know, he just, he, that's the way he hears, you know, music and, and, uh, Thank God, because those solos are some of the best, greatest of all time. Still, it's a friend of mine, a great drummer. I used to play with Tony Fortuna in New York. Well, in a band that we had in Brooklyn. He, uh, he's like, yeah, that solo's going right now, the Comfortably Numb solo. He's like, it's, it's playing right now. I go, I know. It's like off into the sunset. It's like, what a great way to, huge influence on me as far as song structure and uh, doing a solo like that at the end of a song. We, Helmet has a, a, a few things like that so beautiful yeah i was lucky enough to see gilmore on his last solo trip around uh, in 2016 with Leonard, cool. my brother at the hollywood bowl you know it was it was so sick uh wow. cool. thanks cool. for sharing yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, michael mcdonald turned 69 today that's my mother's all-time favorite musician and uh, shout out to my mother and michael mcdonald mom 69 years old uh -huh. You're not Go too ahead. far away from that. <laughs> so she must she must love Steely Dan. Everyone's gone to the movies. That's one of his great vocal performances. Or Peg, you know, we try to do we try to do Michael McDonald. Um, Steely Dan's in heavy rotation in my band, um, and uh, we you know so we try. You know we try. Ain't no water, no It's like impossible. <laughs> See, Paige, Paige Hamilton of Helmet even imitates Michael McDonald uh, yeah, flawlessly. Poorly, poorly. He was amazing, man. I saw him with the Doobie Brothers um, when I was 16, maybe. I'd have to look it up. 16 oh. or 17 was when I started going to concerts. It's when my parents would let me go to concerts. Uh, I saw the Doobies. Um, it was the, uh, I want to say, Fault Line tour, like... Uh, that album had come out, um, You Belong to Me, that album. Because uh, my girlfriend at the time, well, when, when I was 19, she would sing that song all the time. <laughs> Think of our song, well, back in the long ago. <laughs> oh, what a fool believes, yeah. And I'd be like, I'd be like stop playing that fucking song. You know? <laughs> but there's also great. some funny, funny Paul Rudd moment in, um, I forget if it's 40 year old virgin maybe where he's like going crazy because they're playing Michael McDonald at the, at the, at the shop, you know, at the video, I think it's a video shop or an electronic shop or whatever. Um, that's, you know, so I can see how somebody, I know like Lee Ronaldo from Sonic Youth once was made a crack about Steely Dan and it's, and, and you know, cause they have, they do have like a light jazz side to them. Um, yep. but I just grew, I grew up on pretzel logic and can't buy a thrill. I love those records um and um countdown to ecstasy so the michael mcdonald's is obviously on katie lied and i think that might be the first album he sang on with them katie lied but uh that's my first introduction to him and then the doobie brothers but that's he's good. pretty phenomenal yeah you know it and there's a quote quote of the day here on is no one i'm here with Paige hamilton the founder the singer the guitarist songwriter of rock and rollers helmet honor to got helmet on the back of this shirt because you know, you played it in a little place. Oh, nice, St. Vitus. Cool. That's a cool yeah. shirt. I yeah. did their, I did their program um, with Chris. Really good. Cool. Yeah, St. Yeah. Vitus. Had a cool. Uh, um, Insta, Instagram, Instagram thing, which oh, okay. I'm lame with social media. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. That's a cool, cool bar. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, great times in there. Uh, quarter of the day is from uh, one of your favorites, Beethoven, and uh, music is the electrical soil in which the spirit lives, thinks, and invents. And oh, nice. Nothing more ca captures your career, your 30, 40 plus year career in this business. Uh, you touched on it a little bit before with your Doobie Brothers impressions and stuff, but what first yeah. got you into music? Because this is this is your livelihood, this is your blood and your, your sweat yeah. you know, for so long. I I have to credit my cousins Rhonda and Carrie up in the Dalles, Oregon. They were they were like older siblings to me. Um, I'm the oldest of three, so so I, um, I didn't have an older sibling, and, and Rhonda and Carrie were kind of like my big sisters. Um, so whenever we'd go to the Dalles, we we were in heaven. We had a they had a basement at their house. Annie, Wanda, and Uncle Ron had this uh, amazing basement that was like the kids' heaven, and we had records and. They would play everything from the Beatles. I remember the Beatles' Rubber Soul. I remember the Monkees. We loved Last Train to Clarksville. 
you play air guitar to that kiss alive i remember that yeah and I'll, and jim croce so those um those those were kind of the you know those things stood out they turned me on to all that music and um um you know back then when you're at whatever eight nine years old the beatles and monkeys were like equal you know and so you know i didn't know that, that the beatles were you know god or whatever but um mm -hmm. yeah uh, i mean i still love the monkeys but um yeah that was kind of i looked to that i looked to there were a couple of um experiences that it, just because i've done interviews for so many years and that had the band going for so long um people had said what do you what member can you um remember certain moments that were significant and one was i was car sick kid and um where i was in the back of the station wagon my brother and sister were in the you know uh, middle seat mom and dad up front and i was just laying there just and the song came on the radio horse with no name by america Love and it. It, it's the first time i remember closing my eyes and traveling kind of inside this music and i didn't know at the time that was a 12 string and acoustic and and that it's like you know kind of a one chord two chord song you know one chord kind of altered um and this book you know kungas and this really bongos i think and really dry bass and just the sound and the words and the sound of the voices and all this i just kind of went inside this music and i, I remember just this miracle that like, i'm not car sick I, we're driving winding through the mountains in oregon and i'm like this is phenomenal. This is, it was a, this kind of eye-opening, life-changing experience. And then I kind of started, you know, in junior high friends, every, uh, Elton John had like, you know, five of the 10 top 10 songs on the radio. And, and I thought at, when I was 12, there was nobody better. And, you know, years later when I was dating Winona, we, we had dinner with Elton and he was, he told me he was a helmet fan, which could be true. Huh. You know, could have been just blowing smoke up my ass, but he was really nice and he was Elton fucking John, you know, like yeah. I mean, incredible, you know, and we were lucky to have these incredible musicians that were, um, you, you know, pl playing music that we could, that was accessible to us. Cause I, in Medford, Oregon, um, you know, that we get concerts, but it was like heart. We had heart a couple of times rush. Um, Black Oak, Arkansas, Blue Oyster Cult. I saw those bands, uh, the Doobie Brothers, as I mentioned. Um, the Tubes, I got to see the Tubes and they were banned after that. That was my high school year uh, years. Those were my high school years. But um, so all that kind of stuff. And uh, the first time I realized that jazz was amazing, my mom um, uh, would and dad would listen to Dixieland music. And when there was a party, it was always this good vibe because mom and dad would be making cocktails and they were having friends over and it was always Ella Fitzgerald and George Shearing and Dixieland uh, music. And, um, you know, and the Brothers Four too, stuff like, um, you know, Puff the Magic Dragon or whatever. <laughs> but they, that, that stuff kind of seeps into your, you know, in, you know, you absorb it through osmosis somehow. And, and uh, but then, um, mom i got mom a george benson album uh because she loved george benson and i just flip i was i'd never heard anyone play guitar like that and it was a pop album called reason but a phenomenal guitar playing and um that kind of turned me on i was like there's there's more more to life than than led zepp because by the time i got to be about 13 14 like the softer stuff sort of went away and um you know i liked i got i got into the eagles that song already gone was kind of the, one of their heavier songs and i go that's what what's with that just sort of guitar that's really cool like i didn't know what it was i just um and then i took a rod stewart album i got two copies of a rod stewart album for christmas one year one for my cousins and one from um, my mom and dad and i took one to the to exchange it and i got the led zeppelin album and that that's when that's the beginning of i'm going to become a musician so that was that little sc string scrape on Black Dog, and then that vocal, that incredible vocal comes in, and you're just like, yeah, just like you're, yeah, 15 years old, and just like that is not like anything I've ever heard ever. And right. So then it kind of started, you know, Zepp and and um, Highway to Hell was another one that I remember of, uh, you know, Running with the Devil. I remember that, like, I'm, yeah. you know, by the time I was in. A freshman in college like what the hell is that you know that that guitar that little scrapey guitar thing at the the, the over the top net you know you know that <laughs> <laughs> that's right 
Yeah, it's so cool. Just, you know, start it. And I, I mean, I was trying to, I'd gotten a guitar when I was 17 and I was trying to figure things out on records like Dwayne Allman, uh, Little Martha was one from Eat a Peach. Um, and um, I, my first teacher, Dennis, was taught me this song Fire on the Mountain by Marshall Tucker, but I wanted to learn Stairway. And he, and he said it was too hard. So I fired him, <clears throat> got another guy, John Sorensen. And John Sorensen really pushed the jazz thing on me, you know, and that, that kind of, because when I think about it, if I hadn't gotten into jazz, I don't know what I, you know, college, you can't, there's not a, you know, you can't go to college for rock guitar, you know, right. yeah. and for classical, classical guitar and jazz guitar. So I just got really lucky with an amazing teacher, this guy, Gary Hagberg, who um, uh, is my kind of my mentor. He's the reason that I believed in myself. And he, um, he wrote a series of uh, books called The Guitar Compendium with Howard Roberts. Uh, the great um, jazz guitarist session guy who started GIT here in Hollywood, which is now MI Musicians Institute. Um, and so I shot my instructional DVD um, and then kind of came full circle. I spoke at one of their graduations, um, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, something like that. But Howard and Gary, a lot of their concepts um, are sort of what, I, what I've been teaching. It's kind of, you know, in, in this whole pandemic, trying to figure out what to do, having, you know, 200 shows canceled and movies that I was supposed to, that was supposed to start shooting in uh, around June, you know, postponed indefinitely. And um, so the teaching thing, you know, had all this kind of history I have with Howard and Gary and his like Super Chops program and uh, Guitar Compendium and I'm applying all that stuff now and sharing it with, with other guitar players. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and you got into jazz music in Medford, Oregon right and yeah you really you wanted to go towards the mecca of that so you moved out to new york city and yeah. that's where you eventually formed helmet um and then it was strap it on that was released your first record in 1990 and i was just blasting that you know over here just blasting that record just uh, getting stoked for our, our segment together and uh there's a song on there and it happened to be michael holden's favorite helmet song was sinatra in fact, that was one of our last exchanges because um, I was just listening to Deftones cover of Sinatra. Yeah. I never knew Deftones covered Helmet. So I hit up Mike because Mike is such a Helmet guy. Hey, Sinatra, what's it? He's like, dude, that's my favorite Helmet song. So uh, what do you think of that Deftones cover of the Sinatra song? And, you know, maybe how was it to record your first studio record with your friends in New York City? Uh, Dream Come True shit or what? Um, a friendly with the Deftones with uh, Chino and Steph. Steph's an ESP brother. Um, I actually sent him a birthday, a happy birthday, uh, a, a weird jazz version of solo happy birthday because we have mutual friends, many mutual friends. Uh, Chester's um, first wife, Samantha, is close with Steph. Um, and our friend Danny Hill, who tour, tour managed Helmet for a while, is close. And um, and uh, we're super friendly and, and I've seen them live a couple of times, but I, I to be honest, I mean, <laughs> I've never checked out their cover. I'm, um, I, oh, I did. I heard Max's band, band uh, after Sepultura. Uh, Soulfly. Soulfly. Yeah, I heard their cover of Meantime because somebody played it for me, you know, and I and uh, which is interesting, you know, different than ours. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really have to check out the Deftones. I wonder if they figured out those chords because it, it took me at when when the band re kind of uh, reignite, I reignited the band. I had to go in and learn a lot, relearn a lot of stuff. Um, Cause I, you know, it'd been seven years and uh, Sinatra was an early, um, in the early set, obviously. Actually, I think there's a, it's on the live album that we're putting out this year. Um, yeah, from CBs, we have, I found a show from CBGB's from 1990. It was, it was kind of the first era of the band. Um, and uh, uh, Toshi Kasai, our good friend who works with the Melvins and um, many other bands, uh, he, he mixed it. And um, yeah, he did an amazing job because it's kind of crap sound quality. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, strap it on, we were, um, I had been writing, we were, we were writing together because we rehearsed religiously three days a week and we we're writing together but there's something about um when you kind of have a uh, a notion 
or, or, you know, a revelation. I don't know what it was. I was just walking home one night and I got the intro riff to um, repetition stuck in my head. Hmm. Um, and, um, and I picked the guitar up and the note was below this, you know, it was, it was an octave below that. It was that. And so I had to go, Oh, I'm going to tune the string down. I knew you could retune, but I was lazy and I just didn't want to relearn things. And, but once I heard that riff, so we had kind of saved up, um, you know, I had been saving up bartending tips and uh, cause you could make good money back then in the late eighties in New York tending bar. Um, and I worked four days a week and, 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 you know, made enough to pay for the first side of strap it on. So um, uh, then we worked for another month and saved up for side two. So that's kind of how, how it went. It was fun. The process was, was fun. You know, there'd be, it was Wharton and I would, we sort of have our hands on the console um and then i you know i'd be john i go john you got to pull the drum part up here or back or whatever so we get if there was something that a move that needed to be made back then there was no automation no pro tools or anything like that it was, it was on wharton um, at the time I, uh, he later got a one inch 24 track machine but i think at the time it was still 16 track uh, machine that he had um and yeah, it was, it was, a, it was just a fun experience, you know, and, and I real I learned a lot. Um, and I realized that, you know, in fancy studios, there's all this isolation. We didn't have isolation at Wharton's. The drums were on one end of the basement. The bass was next to that. And the guitar was next to that. He might've had a gobo, I think, between the drums and the bass. I don't even remember, or some kind of bar bar barrier, but, um, it would just performed live, the three of us in the room. And then uh, we tried the four of us, it was too messy. Um, so I had Peter overdub his parts. And then I overdubbed the vocals and solos. Uh, so we, there were always, there was always kind of, that's how we established our um, sort of, you know, a format, two guitars, bass, drums, and one guy singing. There were, there were very few backing vocals early on, you know, I might've doubled some stuff, I think. and. Uh, we weren't had a, an early kind of sampler um so in sinatra i could do this do this drone you know sing <laughs> sing think it was like you know sing this like and, and and i could blend that in with the droning strings you know which uh um, dude when you when you're going what's the best for me what's the yeah. best for Dude, that part when Chino and Deftones is doing that, it's like it, you oh, hear no. the influence that you've had on on Chino's vocals. It just fits so. That's well. cool. Yeah, Chino said that to me one night when uh, Johnny Tempesta, my my good buddy, and I went to see Deftones, and he he said, "Yeah, I got some lyric and vocal concepts from you, and that's it's it's cool, you know." Love it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Um, and then your next record was Meantime which that brought you on Headbangers Ball. And by the way, Ricky Rockman, he's going to be on next next month uh, with oh, Jose cool. Mangan. We're going to get those guys. And um, somebody told me he, uh, when he first introduced us, he referred, he said, uh, Paige Hamilton went to Manhattan School of Music and she studied jazz guitar. And somebody was like, did you listen to Helmet yet? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's true. I have no idea, but some, because I didn't watch MTV, but... Um, somebody told me that and I go, that's pretty funny. You know, if you'd heard it, heard it in the meantime, you'd be like, that's not a woman. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, there's, there's a song called unsung. And I mean, is that your biggest song? I would say so with the most views, at least on YouTube, but did yeah. you know you're writing a hit that's going to be still on Sirius XM. You know, it's just, did you know you're writing that hit? Cause the drums, you know, there's such a simplicity to it and just a heaviness to it. That's what yeah. you on most about Helmet is the, the heaviness, but the substance, you know. The, the, yeah, the thing with Helmet that's, uh, that <clears throat> it kind of eludes, uh, it eludes the layman um, it is, the, is it, our kind of sense of time and rhythm, you know. And, and what I was, I remember coming in with the riff to Distracted. Um, and John and Henry and I would, we could be, we'd be content to, to, to kind of zen out on a riff for 20 minutes. And that riff was so damn cool. Um, and, uh, Peter would stop. He, I think he wasn't kind of at that point, he wasn't locking in as much with us understanding we're playing this cause we're, we're experimenting going, you know, back of the beat, front of the beat on the beat, kind of the three of us were just 
building our our musical kind of rapport, I guess you could say. And I remember, I'll never forget playing that after we met the Pantera Boys in um, Minneapolis and, and they came to see us and hang in Dallas. And I remember looking down at the pit, we started distracted and Phil had his kind of posse right in front of me and they were standing there for a minute and they, cause they, cause they're, you know, the riff is done, da 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 And it's like, it's in, you can sing it in four, cause, but it, they were like, and it took a minute. And then I remember their faces lighting up when they got the groove and it just went off. And it's, that's the kind of, you know, unsung is a, sort of an example of, you know, ryth rhythmic displacement, right? You have a riff and, and I, I, I use the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony because everyone on planet earth knows it probably. And it's two notes, you know, bum, 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 bum. And unsung is two notes, ba 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 ba, you know, and it's just ah. dis the, just dis displacing the rhythm, much like a, 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 a you know a classical composer would. It's a motif, and in metal or heavy music, we call it a riff or a rock music. And to me, like you, when you have a good um, a good motif, a good riff, the beginning of a riff, it's it's a matter of sort of being patient and developing it and letting it sort of write itself and unsung was one of those songs that i wanted to do something kind of kind of different structurally so that's where that that, that form came where we went into the, the body of the song is you know intro um you know pre pre-intro intro with the verse riff and then uh verse chorus verse chorus and then the, the rest of the song is a bridge basically you know and it's it develops harmonically and I just would sit and play and listen and wait, wait for the chord. Harmonic gravity sort of dictates where a note on any given day wants to go. And I think if you try to force stuff, you know, you and I was very patient with that song, you know, um, you know, I, is it the, the best song I've written? I, you know, not in my opinion, but but uh, but I like it and I still love playing it. And, and, and you know, my lovely ex-wife has a really nice house. Uh, with her kids and husband because of it <laughs> um but um uh she let me have my guitars that was the thing in the, in the i'm gonna let you have your guitars i'm like thank you um but well, riff, yeah. riff creating 101 with Paige hamilton of helmet awesome yeah I, and I, I i i i jest she's i'm i we don't we, sadly we don't speak anymore but i she's i love her she's great just didn't work out but but it's kind of still fun to joke about it yeah. Um, you know, um, but yeah, the, it, it, that, um, that song and, uh, you know, meantime and, um, uh, trying to think what else victim and give it. And, um, I'm looking, looking at my sound, whatever the, uh, the, the, you know, the publishing thing, the, the top 12 or whatever that come in, um, <clears throat> and that, you know, unsung still gets a lot of, a lot of play, you know, I would like, I, I heart my guru or, or uh, you know, Red Scare or something to me are really cool songs. Really like fun, fun to play live. Really fun to play live. And Seven starts, to, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, your next record, Betty. I mean, I've, I've honestly, I've never given that a shot. But it kind of reminded me of the your third record, Betty. Uh, the the um, the flavors of how STP graduated their sound from core to purple to tiny music. And I think that yeah. third record, Betty, I, the different layers and colors, uh, I can't wait to just sit back and put it from start to finish on tonight. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was, man, that Betty, Betty tour was fun. Uh, Me time tour was fun, but Betty is, is a, it was a challenge because we, we never, we had never played Sam Hell uh, live and we only played Silver Hawaiian, you know, early on for a little bit when the album came out. Um, uh, so there were so being able to do the whole album was was great now it's like sam hell's a staple in the set like it's just a great uh you know release for 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 my drummer you know kyle gets a little a breather and the band you know can um you know chill and and it's just fun man it's really really fun it's i think it's so much better now than than the album version it's like yeah you, you, you figure it out you figure out your voicings and you figure out solo stuff i did the solo on a gibson j200 that i no longer own um it was uh because danny korchmar told me i need a j200 so i got one from gibson it wasn't a great j200 that's why 
I got rid of it. It was okay. Um, I, now I have a 1936 L00 um, Gibson that's incredible. I have a Collings, which is a phenomenal guitar. I play it like every day. So um, nice. I have the Collings now. I used the Collings on this. Uh, we did uh, Let It Be um, uh, for the progresshumanity.org is a, a, a something I'm involved with in Washington, D.C. to end global conflict. So they asked me to do Let It Be and ended up using our version for the template for the rest of the world because they're having like 13 or 14 or 15 countries contribute. So oh. I, I did my, use my call-ins on there and, and, you know, and my cool little Royer ribbon mic and it sounds so good, you know. But it, the sound on Sam Hell is interesting. Um, that, that guitar is Henry's, that, that banjo guitar. Um, it's, a, it's an electric guitar with a banjo body um, that we use. And I plugged it into my Super Champ, which I still have. And I've looked for one of those. It's made by Deering, a uh, banjo company, uh, D-E-E-R-I-N-G. Um, and I haven't, I'd like to find one. It's a really cool, cool, mm -hmm. cool instrument. Actually, when Danny Korchmar was producing the Spin Doctors, um, he asked if he could borrow the instrument. And I asked Henry and Henry's like, cool. So I took it to the studio for them. Really good guys. And um, I never heard what they did with it, but Cooch loved that, uh, loved the sound of that too. So there was, the recording has its vibe and, you know, live stuff has its, has its vibe. So, it, you know, we try to stay true to the arrangements um, and helmet, but there's always a little bit of putting the lab coat on and, you know, the roller skates and crashing into things, you know, so that's. Yeah, well put. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. You know, we're, I want to go back to Kurt Cobain real quick because you're the first guest that has ever, and I, I asked no one that has ever met Kurt. And again, I'm here with Paige Hamilton, founder, singer, and guitarist of rock and roll band Helmet. Uh, <laughs> Kurt Cobain, what was your relationship like with him? Um, I know there was a concert you were to play with him, and it was postponed for the birth of his daughter, Frances. And then it came back uh, maybe a month or, uh, later. And I think, were you on that bill when that happened? Or not sure which um, concert you're re referring to. I could, I mean. Um... We were just friendly, friendly peers. Like I said, the first time we played with them was in New York at Pyramid and um, uh, Club on Avenue A. And Chad was their uh, Chad was their drummer at the time. Um, and they just got uh, lost Jason. I, I I don't know the the specifics if if he quit or if they fired him or whatever. But um, they were doing. I remember them work uh, playing a song that was on Nevermind, um, and they were there were some good moments and some, and some struggles, uh, you know, it wasn't a great show, but they were already kind of a big deal because they were friends with Sonic Youth and Sonic Youth were, you know, were, were, you know, they ruled the you know, New York city um, and the, and the indie rock scene, you know, and um, Iggy was at that show um, and, and um, Sonic Youth were there. It's, uh, years later, we played with Sonic Youth in Australia and Thurston said to me, he's like, man, I saw you guys open for Nirvana that, you know, early on, and it was like our second or third show ever. And he goes, it's just like, it was just too much. He goes, I didn't get it. It was so aggressive and loud and fucking, and he goes, now getting to hear you guys every night. It's fucking amazing. He was like, totally just it, like when people would first heard us, I think it was just like, what the fuck? Like just, <laughs> we were so much louder and more aggressive than Nirvana. It was just a very, very different vibe. But um, Chad, I talked to Chad after that show in the basement he was really bummed because they had a i guess it kind of a bad show um and just felt kurt trash stuff because he was unhappy and um uh we didn't really hang out that night i hung out with chad and chris um were great great dudes but then later when um the melvins were playing a gig in a hotel room in new york in um for i think it was um uh, uh, was it cmj or or what was the other one? There was another little festival they had in New York. There were two of them. Um, and we were just hanging in a hotel room and, you know, talk, he, Kurt and I talking and just, I don't even remember what we, what we, we, we talked about. We ended up, um, we were kind of like-minded as far as our, our, our musical, um, I don't know, our sort of in, independent music aesthetic, I should say, but I came more from more of a, Charlie Parker was my punk rock. <laughs> you know, then I didn't listen to Black Flag or um, I didn't listen to any West Coast punk rock stuff. I, I was because I moved to New York and I got I liked um, 
I, I like bands like Government Issue and I Bad Brains. I saw Bad Brains. That was amazing. And um, uh, so I kind of heard that music later later on. And I think Kurt, there were bands like The Wipers that Henry, my bass player, used to play, uh, play at Poison Idea. So Poison Idea opened for um, Nirvana and Slash Helmet when we did um, uh, to raise awareness. And I think money for the uh, No on Nine um, in, in Portland, Oregon, they were trying to ban gay teachers like my brother's gay and I was just like excuse me you're you want to ban gay teach like what the fuck like give me a break you know so of course we wanted to be part of that and we played with them in Seattle um and that's the, the Seattle show I believe is the one no 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 it was ministry it was opening for ministry when Eddie Vedder and Chris Cornell uh I saw him on the side of the stage that was ministry in 92 but so this was would have been God, I forget what year it was, honestly. Um, and we hung out a little bit backstage. Um, Courtney was back there. I knew Courtney before because Toll had opened for Helmet in, in Los Angeles at the at Jabberjaw. Um, and um, and then she came to see us a couple of times and, and then I saw her at CB's. And so I, I knew Courtney for a while. She was kind of being obnoxious, to be honest, um, like talking about my straight teeth and good fucking luck. She had, roped Kurt in to, <laughs> to this relationship, which I, you know, and Kurt, I, maybe he had, I don't know. I don't want to talk shit. Maybe he had self-esteem issues. I obviously, obviously he did because Courtney's not a nice person in my opinion, but uh, I don't like to talk. I don't want to talk shit about anybody. Anyway, she's, she and I were friendly early on. And then when she got with Kurt, we were, she was unfriendly to me. So, and um, yeah. Plus, she told my girlfriend when I, when I, I dated Winona for a couple of years, and she told her that she fucked me, and I'm like, nope, <laughs> never happened. That's just not a cool thing to say to someone's girlfriend, you know, to you know, lie. So, um, but Kurt was nice. He was a really nice dude, you know. I mean, I was I was really sad. We um, they took our sound guy out on the road, um, Craig Overbay, because when we played with them, they we sounded we, we sounded we were a really good live band, obviously, and. Um, we sounded really good. So they thought it was, you know, it was Craig. It's also the band. You have to self mix on stage. Um, Cause Nirvana, I saw them be really, really great. And I saw them be not great. You know, um, they did, they did this show at this movie theater for Mia Zapata when she was murdered. Um, it's the show that uh, Tad, uh, Tad's girlfriend beat up Courtney at. Uh, it was just, backstage drama it was hilarious i i was i had been, went backstage to get a beer or something and then next thing i know there's like this fight this girl fight breaks out and uh they nirvana did a really cool i thought co uh, cover version of uh led zeppelin no quarter um at that show uh really? which was yeah it was really cool i was like fuck because i'm a huge zepp head and i was just like this is fucking cool man um but um, find also, that also when we played at uh, at the Seattle Coliseum with them, we they invite we were invited to go see Alice in Chains because we had a night off and we went to see them, and then then we played the next night. But there was the lawsuit issue over the Killing Joke song uh, "Come As You Are," so they were doing Nirvana during Soundcheck did um, played it like uh, you know the song '80s by Killing Joke that they got sued over um and they so nirvana was playing that with the killing joke b you know eight oh. days you know da, 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 da. I, I can't remember it off the top of my head um anyway uh that was kind of funny so just little things i remember my my now ex-wife and i sitting on the side of the stage um and just marveling at dave Grohl. like i mean sitting there because we were sitting sort of uh, between the drums and then Chris and Kurt and um, just kind of sitting Indian style and just like fuck me this guy is amazing and singing his ass off like backing vocals just sounded incredible you know he was such a yeah I mean he was so good so good he yeah. I mean Chad really good drummer I thought but Dave took him kind of to another level you know I yeah mean, Dave the big drums like, there's the uh the Mopop or the EMP museum in Seattle that I visited a few years back and they have the used drums that Dave played and uh, live and it's just like washer and dryer laundry you know these big ass boomy bass drums and coon 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 I mean 
he's yeah. the reason you know he's one of my big big heroes there yeah he's 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 uh he's a incredible talent that guy right um i, I last time i saw him was with 90 90 snails was in the studio in la in los angeles right by amoeba records um and leo one of trent's assistants from back in the day when i was stated uh, trent had an apartment in, in new orleans when i left my wife i stayed there for quite a while and with Clint Mansell, um, great film composer. Um, and uh, we were, Leo said, I ran into him at Amoeba and he's like, Trent and Grohl are working right up the road. Come say hi. So I went up and saw him. And um, I had just gotten the helmet, uh, the next iteration of helmet together, back together. Um, and they were overdubbing, they had an interesting approach. They, they've recorded the drums without cymbals and they overdub cymbals. Um, hmm. Um, I forget which Nine Inch Nails album it was. What was the one after Fragile? Okay. Uh, uh, was that like, was that With Teeth? With, or with, I think, yeah, I think With Teeth. Really yeah, good. Hero. Yeah, With Teeth probably. Yeah, that to me is kind of one of the, one of his really underrated, really cool. Do you know that record at all? I don't own it. I know a few of the songs. That's it. Yeah, it's a really cool record, man. It's, I had a, it, it was, I think times had just changed so much promotion wise. And like, we all have that kind of thing where you have your breakthrough and then people are on you for a minute. It doesn't matter how great anything is you do after, after your big albums that nothing's ever going to be the same for the fans. So it's like, I think debt for helmet debt to the world is better than, than, than any, any albums we've, we've, we've made, but some people are, you know, I mean, aftertaste I loved, and and people wanted to hear meantime every time we did. And Betty, you get you get slack. We got slack, uh, shit. I got slagged for putting out Betty after meantime because it wasn't meantime, and then slack for shit get slagged for uh, for aftertaste because it wasn't Betty, and then in every, every album you do is like, this sucks. It's, it doesn't sound like you know. You're like, oh my god, we're all trying to push forward. And I thought with teeth was it was better than fragile for me personally. I thought it was a really cool record and Trent was just doing some, some different kind of shit that, that was, um, I don't know. So I think it had to, it had to have been that record, I believe. Yeah. Was, they were yeah. making fragile when I was in new Orleans. Um, and they worked on it for a long time. And I, and I think I'm on some stuff on that record from what I'm told. So. Um, on some stuff from with teeth. I, I think they're fragile. I think they're oh. fragile. People said, I think I'm, credited on a song or something playing guitar Trent, we, we, we did a little jam in the control room um it was really fun he's 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 a uh a remarkable you know i just had bowie and i talked about this that he has a kind of a compositional a great compositional approach to, to writing you know what i mean i don't know that he's a great instrumentalist on i don't know if he's a can play you know play bach preludes on piano or or anything like that but what he does with his his technical ability and his musical ability. And he has this great, he could kind of step back and see the whole picture and, and, and just, you know, like I say, very, very, um, a, a great compositional mind, you know, it's, yeah. Cool. But, uh, I like that. I like, I like that record a lot. He, yeah. He, he actually, he was one of the first guys to release new music during the quarantine. He released ghosts, uh, these two mm -hmm. records. Yeah, yeah. You check that out. Yeah. He's um he's from Cleveland, Ohio. Buffalo, New York's not too far away from there, and yeah. I feel like he's part of that Midwest, you know, Northeast part, one of us. And yeah, yeah. he seems like a cool dude. Great dude. Yeah, nice yeah he's really really good dude. We toured together um, after he did the tour with Bowie, um, and um, we did a small club tour. Like we played Glam Slam in in Florida, South Florida. I think it's like five thousand. Like yeah, this is a tiny little club. <laughs> it was really fun man it was we had a we had a great time we fucked with each other and, and uh you know partied and um he was very very gracious in um in uh when i was in new orleans he said you can stay as long as you want and i was going through a really shitty time you know with the divorce and, and everything and being an idiot and uh he was just really gracious and they, they they taught me how to use a computer and built me on my own little live room uh, my own little recording room in their live room like uh, gave me some gobos and a computer and said this is logic audio we think this would be great for you and uh yeah really kind of got me out of my funk and um 
I very few feel very thankful, you know, for for that, and and sort of set set me up for you know i mean i pretty I, i'm remote producing bands now and using logic audio so people send me tracks and i go through and i add either guitars and vocals or drum parts or whatever and and it's and i wouldn't have been able to do that if they hadn't taught me those guys hadn't taught me how to how to do this shit so that's awesome yeah. man really good really good dude for sure and, and he was ha i think much happier when he got sober because like you know we had some nights that were he got pretty pretty loaded you know, and was, uh, you know, that I, th I think he's, he's, you know, better. I haven't talked to him for years, uh, but yeah, I'll always feel, feel love for him for, for his generosity and, and, um, you know, humor, very funny, funny guy too. We were, we were, went to the record store one day and he said, can you give me like some records, like jazz records and classical records I should check out? And I'm like, yeah. So I made him a list. I don't know how many, maybe 10, you know, six to 10 of each jazz and classical. I said, but just get one of each, live with it for a month and then get the next one. But how do you tell it to a millionaire rock star? He goes and he buys everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was like, okay, well, you can do that too, I guess. But I just, th I just think it's good to live with something and really absorb every bit of it. You know what I mean? And, um, and uh, it's cool, but um yeah, I made the mistake on, on Amazon.com this past year and downtime of just filling my shopping cart with like 40 CDs that I wanted to listen to. And I probably still only listened to one of them once or twice. Right. So it's just a, yeah, it. sit back. I, and I just, I just look back to my formative years and, and having no money. And I'd buy like a, a Miles Davis album, you know, the nice price. And so I'd have, I'd get a $5 a copy of kind of blue or whatever miles smiles or esp or nefertiti water babies whatever it was and i would I would live with that record for a month and get really into it and and um become kind of sort of absorb absorb the music and influence and spirit you know, of music and i did that with coltrane and with miles and with monk and with uh, jim hall and bill evans um and then with same thing with classical music when i you know was in, in school and i was like had all but nine Beethoven symphonies and the overtures and string quartets and then got into Mozart symphonies and um you know and all his other amazing music his operas operas were a little more challenging you know but um I just think it's it's invaluable we're in such a kind of time of where music is can be so feel so uh, everything seems so disposable people are kind of involved with their their devices and and you know I still you know like dropping the needle and listening to, I just, I got my records out of my apartment in New York. I'm finally giving up my place after three years. Um, Congratulations. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of bittersweet, you know, cause it was cool to have it, but I just can't, can't keep it going. Um, but just listening, I would never leave that. If I, if I didn't have enough time to listen to a whole side of an album, I wouldn't put it on because I want to listen to the whole side of the album. You drop everything you're doing and listen to the music and get, you get so much more from it than, you know, the, there's that sort of mentality of, you know, don't bore us, get us to the chorus. My, my good friend, Matt Flynn, that plays drums in uh, Maroon 5, he was, he and I had a band together called Gandhi with three other buddies, um, Anthony Truglio from Leash Lord and our friends Christian and John Andrews, who plays with Nana. And um, Matt is just like the pop, it's pop music, oh, Beyonce, oh, I'm just like, give me a break, dude. Listen to Charlie Parker, listen to Beethoven. You know, it's like, it's like you, 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 Matt would buy songs on my party at my place in Beachwood, and buy songs on iTunes. And we would listen to like 30 seconds of it. And he's stopping by another song. He's like, you got to check out this Justin Timberlake song. You got to check out this, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, Jesus Christ. I wake up the next day. And I've got like 12 pop songs that I, you know, didn't ask for. But um, just a different way to listen to music. And I like, you know, longer forms. And, and I mean, one of my favorite albums of the last 20 years is uh, um, uh, Scott Walker Tilt. And it's, it's, uh, it's a challenging record, but it's incredible, man. It's just so emotional and so musically deep. And, um, and I think, you know, that's, uh, that's just my approach, you know. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm sitting around, you know, <laughs> playing, trying to play Thelonious Monk tunes. And, you know, I've been, been, you know, working on this, this thing right here, this yeah, Billy Strayhorn. Yeah, it's a, it's incredible. Just, you know, 
Yeah, I'm writing a piece for the Christian Brothers, which is the oldest high school orchestra in the country in Memphis, Tennessee. So that their 150th anniversary is 2023. So I'm, I'm writing a piece for them. I'm, I'm excited about it. Just kind of started a sketch because um, I got to finish these producing things. But um, so it's fun, you know, keep it busy. Kind of yeah, it's fun to have different challenges. You know what I mean? It's like I'm, I, I, I like it. I love Helmet, and um, we have some stuff coming out. Some uh, cover, cover song box set, and then we have the live, live CBGBs and the Big Day Out show, um, side A and side B. But um, we're talking about it's kind of starting to starting a new album. So that's I think that will be. Hell yeah, man! Yeah. yeah, it's fun. It's really I had really a lot of fun making Dead to the World. It was a blast. So we'll it keep was the great to be for video those releases. What? We'll keep a lookout for those releases, man. Yeah, thanks. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. You mentioned Dave Bowie, and I just have to ask you, what's one word that you can use to describe it, how it felt to be on stage, guitar in hand, facing the crowd, and you make eye contact with a smiling, multicolored-eyed David Bowie in the mm -hmm. middle of the show? I mean, that must have been awesome to tour with such, a, with such a, an artist, huh? Yeah. Um, it was uh, it was pr pretty pretty amazing to like. I mean, I had to learn thirty songs in two weeks, which was pretty daunting. And I just left my wife, uh, and I was in a kind of tailspin, you know, of drugs and womenizing, being a total idiot. But so he kind of snapped me out of that because when you get a call from David Bowie, uh, you, you know, you're like, yeah, I better stop this bullshit and get my shit together, you know. Like, yeah. Um, the, the, I, there, I have made so many impressions, like one, the first day I got together with him, well, I met, met him in the studio and, um, uh, we talked about stuff and he's, and then I got a list of songs. And then, so I started working on some stuff and I played quicksand with him. We never did it live. Um, uh, but he and I played it, um, at, at the rehearsal space and it was pretty amazing. We didn't have our in-ears. We just had a couple of wedges and a, uh, upside down mic stand bass for an ashtray. And the two of us sat and smoked and talked and played through songs, um, just the two of us. And that was that was a pretty wow. funny. I remember sitting there playing during the song, and this voice comes out of the my wet my monitor into my <laughs> face, my ears, and I was just like, <laughs> "What the fuck, dude?" It was. Uh, it's it's yeah. It's it's pretty pretty insane. Um, I bet. He, we did one of the covers, actually the box set's called Move On. Um, and the, we did a cover of Move On from Lodger. One of the most underrated, one of my all time favorite Bowie songs. One of the most heart wrenching, emotional, incredible vocal performances that I think he's ever um, done. And the, the backing vocals are like this phenomenal choir of Bowie's that figuring, figuring it out was a bitch. Thank, I thank God for my vocal uh, a guy Mark Rank who who did Let It Be with me, who does every album I do. I try to bring him in. I couldn't fly him to New York for the um, Monochrome record, but we he, he and I did some pre production. Um, so he, he's just really good at, at, at you know coming up with cool uh, harmonies and backing vocal parts and um, kind of he kind of opens my brain to that shit. But yeah, but we worked on uh, that cover. I'm really proud of it. It's it turned out really really great. I was really hoping. David would get to hear it um, but one thing led to another and the label was slow and here we are four years later um, and it's finally getting released but um, yeah he's he's another um, he's he's different for anyone I've ever ever worked with or met there are a couple people that that had a had a have had a huge impact on me and Bowie Bowie would be one David Torn would be one um, Elliot Goldenthal would be one and Glenn Branca um, those guys all kind of come to mind for people that really changed, you know, or affected, influenced how I play and write and think about music. And Bowie, I felt the co coolest thing was like, I felt, because I never felt legit as a musician. I'm, I'm like, and I told him, I was like, I'm not really a guitar player. I'm a shit sculptor. I go, I do weird, noisy shit and heavy punch you in the face riffs and I play jazz, I fake through jazz guitar and he's like oh shut up he's like you you can play he's like you've played in front of this many people before and I'm like yeah with helmet my music I wrote on a beach in Brazil you know 
but playing, you know, in front of whatever it was, a billion people for the Net Aid concert at Wembley Stadium, which is three size, you know, three times the size of my hometown in Oregon, you know, is is pretty daunting. And if I fuck up Rebel Rebel, people are going to hang me, you know. But um, <laughs> it was uh, it was cool. It was a lot of work. It was also uh, I got to say, being a band leader and and being the you know uh, the, the primary writer and you know for thirty years in my band, also being kind of trying to fit into a, a situation with other musicians when you're just sort of a hired guy is, uh, was interesting for me as a challenge, you know, um, to say the least. Um, Cause uh, you know, I, I feel like I was just getting my feet wet with it. And, and uh, um, then the helmet thing popped up again and uh, it was a great, it was an honor. It was a great experience. You know, it made me a better musician. Um, and um, I love him. I cried obviously when he died and it was, devastating i you know i was just hoped i would see him again you know um i the last time i saw him uh he came to la to play um and uh it was at the i believe it was the greek um and my manager um was working with him at the time uh, managing him and uh, so we went to the show together and I, and I don't like the backstage uh, Hollywood schmooze thing. So I wanted to leave and my manager is like, you're not leaving. You have to say hello. And, and I was like, oh, fuck. So I just was in this awkward, socially awkward kind of backstage with all these, you know, rock stars and stuff. I mean, they, and, you know, nice people. I know Gavin Rossdale really well. And I know Manson. I know Serge from System. And Anthony Kiedis and Flea and actors and actresses and stuff. And I just get, I get uncomfortable around those and I just wanted to go, I just wanted to leave. So <laughs> David came in, when he came in, he's like, first thing he said, he's like, where's Pagey? And he came out and gave me a big hug. We talked for five minutes and, and then I and then I was able to split. So um, when we were, when I was playing with him, I didn't like hang around him. You know what I mean? Like we, I would, he sat down with me at LaGuardia once we were, eating, I was eating Chinese food and I would always kind of stay to myself. He came and sat down with me and ate and then so he would I feel like he was torturing me because he would sit right in front of me a lot, you know, and it's sort of like the boss and, and I, I love him, you know, I feel love for him, you know, no question, but I also didn't want to want him to feel that I was trying to get anything from him, you know, other than just be able to learn his music and play his music with him. And that was that was the gig for me, you know, when if you if you look at the Saturday Night Live footage, you can see I'm sticking. I think I'm standing in the back, you know, at the end of the show and everybody's waving and, you know, I'm mugging for the camera. I'm just like, I'm content to be there and have gotten to play those songs with him on stage. And, um, it was, it was great, great experience. You know, he's a, he's, he's one of a kind, you know, there's, he's definitely one of a kind, you know, I, I'm, I have no doubt in my mind that he's a genius. Um, you know, and he's, he, he was a voracious reader. Everywhere we were, he was always reading, and um, yeah, just you know, a lo lo lovely human being too. You know, when I, I would I would be the only one in the band that drank. We were in Dublin, and I had a fucking blast. Um, this the brother of the band Coors, these three beautiful women and their brother. Their brother was really cool, and he and I got drunk on Guinness, and we hung out. And I got a I got a terrible hangover. We were in the V in a the VIP lounge or whatever at the airport. And I had a paper over my face and Bowie came in and kissed me on the forehead. He's like, Oh, Paige, he's got a hangover. He called me hangover. I told uh, Dale from uh, Melvin's loves to tease me with this. He's like, hangover Hamilton. Cause he's like, Oh God, hangover <laughs> Hamilton. Again. You know? hey, they didn't know that I had just left my wife of 10 years and that I was going through a shitty time in my life. And I wasn't, you know, I, I you, you go through a dark period and, um, I didn't realize how dependent upon her I was and how much I, you know, loved her and, and how, what a shithead I did turned into, you know what I mean? So. Uh, well, that's yeah. beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing and enlightening yeah. us about David Bowie, the person. Uh, I can't wait to rewatch that segment. So thanks so much for that. One yeah. of my future guests coming on is going to be D. Randall Blythe. Randy Blythe from Lamb of God, lead singer, Richmond, Virginia. He's a big fan of yours. In fact, he was in the crowd at the flood zone in Richmond and the date, Randy, I did some homework, man. 
June the 4th of 1993, you guys played with Jesus Lizard. And Randy wants me to ask you, what is your best Jesus Lizard story? And, um, you know, he saw you back then. He said many where, years ago. Well, where, where was that show? This was at a place called The Flood Zone in Richmond, Virginia. Right, 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 right. I love Richmond. Uh, we got funny because, well, we went to the slave pit guar once um, there. And we I mean, also we crashed. We used to crash at people's houses. There would people would generously... I'd get on stage on a mic and ask for a place to stay. And I, I remember, I remember this Richmond thing. Then, hey, if you want to take a shower in the bathroom, I went upstairs and the bathroom was backed up with like black sludge. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass there. But uh, the slave pit was cool. We, um, that was, I love Guar, but um, God, there's so many uh, Jesus lizard stories, and they, they, they kind of revolve around, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> Whiteheads and Whiteheads, uh, Yao's, um, David, I said David Whitehead's my manager, David Yao's sh uh, shenanigans, uh, you know, because he's was such a unique, is such a unique front man. Um, one of my favorite experiences or favorite comedy moments was when we, we played Tampa, um, which is a death metal capital, I guess, of the United States. And uh, he, um, uh, obituary is from there and they brought helmet t-shirts backstage and they had the t-shirts were black t-shirts with the four band members on them and um yeah was with us when they gave us the shirts he's like oh shit can we wear these on stage and i'm like sure and david sims is like no i'm not doing i'm not wearing a fucking you know obituary t-shirt on stage and yeah i was like if i do the show with no pants on will you do it and he sims is like yeah so David Yao, people may or may not know this, he wears cowboy boots and he wears, you know, Levi's blue jeans with no underpants. So if he's got no pants on, that means there's, he's going commando. And I'm 6'3", he's probably 5'4", you know, maybe uh, a foot shorter than me. So my shirt is like a dress on him. So he's out on stage with his cowboy boots, otherwise buck naked and this t-shirt that looks like a dress on him. And Every single show, I swear, first song, he's off the stage from the foot on the monitors and he's crowd surfing. So I'm sitting there watch, watching him. And all I see is like, he's got the mic jammed into his face and he's holding his nuts with his other hand. <laughs> and he gets, he gets this like reptilian look in his eyes when he's, when he's, he's kind of possessed when he's on stage. He's kind of, he becomes a different character. I mean, partially alcohol fueled, partially kind of part of his brilliance is he gets just gets into another zone on stage as a lot of us do. So I just see this weird look on his face and his bare ass like bobbing <laughs> across the crowd with him guarding his jewels and certain way. You know, I can't remember. I wish I could remember what song they, they opened up with. It was Dudley or something like that. But uh, yeah, that was that was one of my favorite favorite you know moments you know as far as tour comedy there were we have a lot of a lot of great stories john stanier and i rode with with the jesus lizard to wilmington north carolina we had a night off from our tour and they booked a show so we said we'll roadie for you guys so that was really fun me and Dwayne listening to yes relayer cha 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 you know in the car and, and um it, it, they had a minivan i think a minivan and a regular van and um, that was really fun. There was also, we had a run in in uh, Charlotte where the promoters didn't want to feed the opening bands, like which, and, and yeah, said something on stage. I didn't, I didn't catch it. I heard about it and they were threatening them at their van, these kind of mafiosa dudes. So Rob Echeverry and I went tearing over to the, to the van and got stepped in. Um, it's like, you know, Fuck it, because yeah, I was tiny. I mean, he's a, you know, but uh, there we had a lot of, lot of, you know, some rough moments like that, but mostly great, great moments, you know. And they, they're one of the best live bands that that we we ever uh, had on tour with this, you know, for sure. Awesome, it's good to know, and and thanks for sharing. There you go, Randy. Um, yeah, I was yeah. looking up that that set list from the from the show, and Setlist FM didn't have any set list that you guys had or Jesus Lizard. But right around that same time, you know, you talk about Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails. 
Nine Inch Nails was touring with uh, Bauhaus at the same time. Uh, local oh, cool. Headline. You know, that was, that was like a, the week or two prior, which was, hey, man, I guess in the early 90s, Flood Zone in Richmond was the place to be. So awesome. That, that's familiar. I can't, I can't re specifically remember. Um, remember I remember, uh, God, there was a cool band that opened for us. I can't have lose it. The name escapes me, but I think I, you turned me on to this band called Butter Glove. That was <laughs> from that was really cool. <laughs> Butter Glove, I'll never forget that. Remember that Butter one. Glove yeah. from Richmond, Virginia? Butter Glove. I'm pretty sure it was called Butter Glove. Um, okay. I, I'm blanking on the, the uh, musician's name. I was a vegetarian at the time, and he made me vegetarian homemade soup and brought it in a, like a vodka bottle or something. <laughs> uh, fuck, I'm drawing a blank. That was so long ago, man. Yeah. Yeah, well, 2018, you played with Gojira as direct support in Prague, Czech, well, not Prague, but it was in Czech Republic at a festival called, um, geez, what was the name of it? It was Brutal Assault. So my buddy is tour manager for Gojira. Gojira are big fans of yours, um, by the way. And there was <laughs> Taylor Bingley, tour manager Gojira. He apologized. He says he's sorry. He's from Canada. But um, there was a beer that was you chucked out to the, the stands, out to yeah. the crowd, and then it came back, and it came back actually off the, one, of the, one of the lighting things up there, and it went all over Gojira's guitars and, and their guitar world. So then Taylor's yeah. like, well, Paige is throwing a beer at me. I'm going to throw this beer right back at him. So he threw a beer at you in uh, Czech Republic, and you guys had, you guys cleared it up afterwards. It was a complete misunderstanding. So I, I apologize. I apologize. I was, um, I, I've, you know, in my old age, I've gotten very good at um, sort of brushing things under the rug as far as technical issues on stage. I used to smash, I mean, this, this beautiful instrument, my, you know, my, my child, this thing is, you know, been put back together from being smashed in Minneapolis and, and uh, in Toronto and stuff. And, and I would never do it, do that now, but um that I left my, uh, it was the end of a tour, it was the last show for us. And I was really, really, really frustrated with our stage tech. He was just doing a shitty job. Um, and we were, just, and he, he, I mean, like 15 minutes before we are going to go on stage, coming up to me like the strap locks broken on this guitar, or what should I do? You know, I'm just like, we pay you to take care of this shit. What have you been doing all day? And shit wasn't, it's, it's really frustrating when you're on stage in front of, you know, whatever, I don't know how many people were there, 10,000 maybe, um, or whatever. And it wasn't a huge show, but pretty big. And, um, and when shit goes wrong, you know, and I just was, I was super frustrated. I think I threw the beer. I think I threw it in the air really high, a full can of Budweiser. And it came down on their guitars. I felt terrible, and I apologize. I apologize. He apologized too. Uh, yeah, it's you can't let your emotions get the better of you. But it's very emotional music. It's intense playing in front of people, and I'm very much in the moment. And I, um, I was just really frustrated. That tour had been a, a kind of one thing after another: comedy of errors, technical shit going wrong. I've told him million times put the pedal board away cover stuff because opening bands will break shit and sure enough they snapped off like 15 you know jacks into my switcher my bradshaw rig and, oh. and so i had to be you know five minutes before we're going to go on i'm enjoying my scotch because i always let, let myself have a single malt scotch before i go on to kind of relax me like 10 minutes before and He's like, I'm getting no sense, you know, it just was one thing after another. And that, that show was the culmination of a, of a frustrating. So yeah, it was yeah. bad. It, it was my fault, it was 100% my fault. He did nothing wrong. He got pissed and he threw, I think he threw the beer back at me, which <laughs> I would have done. Anything, you know? Yeah, he's a diehard Buffalo Bills fan. He's a, he's a buddy of mine and, you know, Gojira, yeah. like Metallica, these are bands I've seen all around the world. And, and yeah. real quick, last few questions. Uh, you like Metallica and have you ever met James Lars any moments with them over the years that stand out to you met met um Hammett um and uh a, a couple of times when we were with ministry and then opening for Primus and uh 
uh, I had a, I had a nice time with Lars on the Guns N' Roses tour. He came to Oakland and he, we were in um, Sebastian's dressing room and uh, just laughing, having fun. He, he, um, uh, he, he was making fun of Sebastian when he got fat and was wearing sweatsuits and teasing him. And it was really funny. We all went down to see Axel. It was uh, Sebastian, and myself and Lars. And so this whole entourage of people came and followed us. And the guy was the security guy was sitting in front of Axel's dressing room with his earpiece in and his, you know, secret service, whatever, like in the suit. And he just looked at us and he did this. Axel wasn't ready. He was still in his post gig, whatever he does or whatever. Um, and so we just, <laughs> I think Lars said something like, oh, rock stars. And so we turned around the three of us and walked back and everybody falls back. But I really yeah. liked Lars. I enjoyed him. He was really nice. Kurt, um, he was he got pissed at our drummer John Stanier because we were watching Primus on New Year's Eve side stage after we played Oakland Coliseum. Um, and John is a big six foot five, you know, <laughs> like Frankenstein dude with like you know, like this. And he stepped, he bumped into Kurt or something, or stepped on him or something, and he got all pissed off. And I and I was just like, we were smoking, I think we were smoking cigars and just getting drunk, and that was kind of Kurt was nice the first time I met him at the ministry thing, but that that night I saw him get kind of mad for no reason. I was like, they gotta calm down, dude. It was, you know, John loved Metallica. So I did a cover of Motor Breath um, for the for the Metallica tribute album. You can check it out. Um, that was really fun. Um, the the guy Bob uh, Bob Kulik, Bruce Kulik's brother, who um, Bob passed away last year. Sadly, he was when I first moved here after my divorce, I was pretty broken. He's like, I'll give you a thousand bucks to play and sing on this tribute album. At first, I did Dr. Love by Kiss, then I did Motor Breath. Huh. And then ACDC, I did uh, Rock and Roll Damnation, but I, I refused to sing because Bon is my God. He's the greatest singer ever. Um, and impossible to, and he, you know, I knew the ACDC track would be Limp Dick, and it was just, you can't do ACDC. You can't cover ACDC. It's just not possible. It's like covering ZZ Top, just can't be done. That, those bands are just, they're just untouchable, you know? Yeah, but, that's uh, true. Yeah, but yeah, it's cool. I like Metallica, you know? Cool. I like that, I just, uh, first couple of records, I like Trapped Under Ice. I don't, I'm not a, like an aficionado or whatever. I don't know. I didn't think that Hitler thing was really funny. Um, did you oh, see that? My Evil during the Justice Tour where they would, they would do that thing yeah well this was the hitler this was um hitler reacting to metallica working with lou reed um check oh. it out on youtube it's oh, that, that movie that. Oh. it's it's the it's the last days of hitler in the bunker and then there it's all in german and so they overdub they uh, wrote english text then it was like you know I forget what it was. <laughs> he was like, anyone who can't play the fills, the drum fills to, you know, something like leave the room right now, you know, so all these people leave and it's just like, it's like, and they're, at this point, their bad albums outweigh their good albums, you know, and it's, it's fucking hilarious. Uh, really, that record is something else, man. I mean, we'll, we could go off in a tangent about Lulu, but that's some of the, I mean, the fastest picking they've had since Puppets. I mean, it just, it's really yeah, yeah. fast and just, just, just fucking cool. yeah, crazy. Yeah. So, uh, great. I, saw him on, I saw him on Howard Stern. They sounded great, man. It was a, a couple of months ago. They sounded great. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Howard Stern and uh, Colbert, the rerun is actually tonight. If you're, if you're interested to see oh. it on NBC. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So just real quick, just wanted to bring up uh, composer things. I've met Howard Shore. I used to be a front of house manager at Wolfgang Puck at Hotel Bel Air. And he would stay in the presidential suite. I'd have conversations with him. Same thing with John Williams and John Williams. I told him, thank you. Your compositions have had a positive impact on my life. And oh, thank you very much. And you come in a few times. I mean, he's he's Beethoven to me, you know. But yeah. what are some composers that stand out to you that most inspire you to make your own compositions in your own film scores? I know you're an Elliot Goldenthal fan. And I took a look. He, he scored the movie Sphere in 1998. I love me some Sphere. Yeah. He's uh yeah, Elliot's a genius and I, I adore him and his wife, Julie Tamor is a genius. They're two of the coolest people and smartest people I know. And Tease Goal, who's Elliot's producer is, is fucking phenomenal. Um, all, everybody that works with Elliot from, you know, um, 
uh, so Joel and Lawrence and um, uh, uh, Rick Martinez, who used to play in Blood, Sweat and Tears. And I did a track with them for with Bono for uh, The Good Thief and Rick played organ. Um, I played guitar, Rufus, Rufus Reed played bass. Free, free, I mean, Bono sang, um, that's life, really cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, the, the, I go through periods where I'm obsessed with, with you know, the, 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 the uh, big three, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart. I've listened to those three, you know, over the course of my life, you know, I can only listen to Beethoven for like a month at times. Like I, when I just drove to Oregon for the holidays, I listened to all nine symphonies twice. Um, and, you know, and I've been to Beethoven's Pasqualiti apartment. I've been to his, uh, his uh, house in Baden where he worked on several of the symphonies, including the, the ninth and sixth and third. Okay. Um, I've been to his uh, 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 Heiligenstadt apartment as well. Mozart, I've been to his apartment in Vienna, the only existing apartments, Figaro House. It's on Domgasse, Domgasse 5, to, to be exact. Um, and I uh, love them and Bach. I've tried playing Bach on the guitar for a million years and he's phenomenal. I've been to his grave site in, the, in Leipzig, the church. He's buried in the, the um, uh, some Marius Kirche. Uh, what's the name of the church? Marcus Kirche? Uh, anyway, he's uh, stashed a helmet pick under the pew that they'll never find, hopefully, because it was all dusty and cobwebby. Oh. So I'm that, I got a good helmet pick like that far from Bach's, where Bach's buried. Um, but then, you know, I got into when I moved to Los Angeles, uh, uh, KUSC is one of the best radio stations in the country. And I got turned on to an uh, uh, English composer named Ray Fawn Williams. Um, the Lark Ascending will be played at my funeral. It's incredible. His serenade to music is incredible. His Fifth Symphony is incredible. Um, there's a lot of great music. I love Samuel Barber and Elliot's like, do you just like the Adagio for strings? I'm like, no, I like the three essays for orchestra, the school for scandal. I like. A lot of Samuel Barber was a great American composer. Um, Bella Bartok is one of my all time, hands down genius heroes. I've been to his house as well as his grave in uh, Hungary. Um, fucking string quartets for life changing, concerto for orchestra, music for strings, percussion and chalets are in incredible. Um, miraculous, Mike Watt and I talked about Miraculous Mandarin, incredible piece. Um, God, there's so many, so many phenomenal composers that have, you know, that have changed my life. I mean, Howard Shore, I just watched, um, I watched that Robin Williams documentary, Robin's Wish. And so then I had to watch the only movies they had on my flight back from New York yesterday were uh, Mrs. Doubtfire and, uh -huh. um, and Good Morning Vietnam. So I watched those and Howard Shore scored uh, Doubtfire. Um, and as you know, Lord of the Rings and uh, great, he's great. Elliot's great. Um, James Newton Howard, I worked with him on kind of on uh, Collateral. He was I I knew him before I knew anything about film scoring. Bernard Herman is a was phenomenal. The Hitchcock's main guy, and he also did Taxi Driver. Was that Collateral um, with Tom Cruise that you're talking about here? Yes. Oh yeah, right. love that movie. Love the atmospheres of it. Yeah. Wow. Nice. There's a great composer, younger guy named Alexander. Des I I'll mispronounce it. French guy. Des de de plat de splat d e s PLAT, and he was managed by a guy named Bobby Urband, who I had a couple of meetings with, and Bobby decided he was going to manage me as a film composer, and he ended up getting cancer and passing away, sadly. Um, his, his assistant was Mike per Percaro, the bass player from Toto's Daughter. Um, I remember that really good, nice guy, nice, nice girl. Um, uh, Mike, I believe, passed away, because Jeff Percaro is one of my drumming heroes. Uh, he, you know, was, I'm not a qualified that was saying Toto. I, I have incredible admiration for them as musicians. That music is not something that I love because it, it it's it's it just wasn't. You know, when Boston and Foreigner and Journey and Toto's bands were really really good, and came up. I wasn't. It wasn't kind of my world in high school. I was listening to, to different shit. You know, but um, uh, but Steve Lukather is a fucking phenomenal guitar player and Jeff Percaro is a phenomenal drummer. I mean, all of this, the, them are great players. Uh, um, Mike and uh, there's one more brother. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, Desplat is one of his, was one of his clients. He's a really great composer. Um, um, trying to think who else, like, like off the top of my head, I, you know, com composer wise that I listened to, I've spent a lot of time um, listening to um i don't know there's yeah 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 well thanks for sharing those uh I, well my little brother leonard he 
just moved up to Portland, Oregon. What does want from Napa Valley? And uh, he's going through a transition now in the wine business. What's one thing Leonard's got to do in Portland, Oregon? One thing he's got to eat that stands out to you? Well, everybody goes to Voodoo Donuts, I guess, um, um, if you want to wait in line. I don't know. Do you, I'm trying to think. In Portland, I would go to, um, I, th I think it's Ringside, the steakhouse there, if you eat meat. Or, or you have to go to, one thing you have to do is go to Powell's Books. Still my favorite bookstore in the world. Um, uh, that's an incredible, uh, uh, incredible spot. You can find used, used books for, you know, very reasonable um, and they have everything. It's, it's, one, it's really great bookstore. Um, trying to think, uh, oh, the, the, uh, the place, my, um, uh, the, 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 I think my favorite restaurant there would have to be this place called Jake's. Um, it's, a, it's a seafood place um, and it's, it's, you can walk to everything in Portland. It's this big, it's tiny, you know, it's a tiny town. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that Jake's is incredible. My parents had a date there and cause my parents met in Portland in the fifties. Um, and they had a date at Jake's in like 19, I don't know, 56 or 57 or something like that. A few years before I was born. Uh, and the food's still amazing there. It's fantastic. I, I ate there probably a year ago. Um, there you go, Len, your first dinner date. When you meet that first girl in Portland, you got to get your ass to Jake's per page. Because per, you can sit you can sit at the bar and there's a pea trough where the sailors would come in and they didn't, I guess they didn't have the energy to walk to the bathroom so they could just drink their beer and yeah. pee right in the, it's oh. a tiled trough that, you know, it's like, which had to be really sanitary, you know, it's oh, been man. there for long. Yeah. Well, in closing, I have Paige Hamilton here of Helmets, frontman, singer, guitarist, performer, influencer. Uh, what is the greatest gift being Paige Hamilton of Helmet has given you after all these years in the business? And oh, I don't know. Like, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm kind of too consumed with my daily um, sort of pursuit of, of, you know, music, <laughs> musical perfection, which will never come, um, to, you know, working on stuff to think about what, you know, I mean, sometimes pe pe uh, people are like, you yeah, know, you're Paige Hamilton. I'm like, yes, I, I am. I'm just this, you know, nerd that loves the guitar and loves music and loves, you know, jazz and classical music and Marley and punk and, and you know, I lo loves a lot of different kinds of music. So I don't, you know, I feel really fortunate that I get to do what I love. And even, you know, I, I think one of the one thing you what you um, it's our responsibility as, as older musicians with experience is to share our experience with younger musicians. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a class at the School of Rock and it's one of the most fulfilling, amazing. I got 11 year old kid Hunter and, and teenage kids. And um, it's it's really cool. It's, it's you know, it's my, my one of my hero mentors, a guy named John Stoll from Portland, Oregon, a great jazz guitarist. He said, Paige, you have to share your knowledge and what you've learned with people, you know? And, and he does that graciously and generously. And he's kind of like, you know, like Buddha to me, so. Um, that's, that's, you know, music will keep you humble. If it doesn't, then you're, then you're going about it in the wrong way. Yes. It's a beautiful thing, man. And if someone wanted a guitar lesson with you, is there a website or is there, does, do you roll that way? Is there, yeah, my, my, yeah, on my website, I think they have a link. It's pagehamiltonmusic.com. And I think probably on the helmetmusic.com site, there's a link to me on my website. Um, and then there's like a lessons thing and, um, I'm really lame with that stuff, but I have a, a great, my, my manager and his, his awesome wife and son have helped set this all up and they have a, uh, they help me with the Instagram and all that stuff. So yeah, I think just pitch out with the music, you can get on that and there should be a, and, um, it's fun. They're cool. I had a lot of fun doing it. It's, it's something I didn't expect would be this much fun. It's really also kind of helped me reorganize my, um, my work, uh, habits, you know, cause if you have, three or four lessons in a day, like today, I'll have to, I'll, you know, I'll have to sort of a lot time to it. And it's also made me think about how can I, how can I share the fretboard with this person that doesn't have the same, you know, experience that I have and, and, and make this fun, you know, make, make it fun and keep it fun for them. So it's been really cool. I, I actually love it. So changing lives, man, it's, it is such a cool thing. And next week I'm going to have my aunt Colleen on, it's her birthday. Uh, Aunt Colleen, get ready for that. But man, cool. you mentioned so many bands. What was that? Thanks, Kevin. I, I appreciate it. I probably should uh, run here. We're 1.30 and I have to uh, to get out. So 
No problem, man. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry, stay heavy. And thanks so much, Paige. Have a good one. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. Hey, stay safe. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It was fun. My pleasure, man. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.